Welcome to Tuning In, the podcast of the Handel and Haydn Society, recorded in Boston, Massachusetts. H and H is the nation's longest-running arts organization, founded in 1815, and since the 1980s has been a leader in the performance on period instruments of music from the Renaissance through the 19th century. In each episode of our podcast, we explore music and artistry, and the way both weave us through society and life in general, within the early music field and outside of it. We highlight music featured during the society's past and that planned for its future. I'm your host, Guy Fishman. On the first episode of Tuning In, I spoke with Handel and Haydn's artistic director Harry Christophers, who talked briefly about a seminar for young singers run by his UK-based group, The Sixteen. He mentioned that the participants worked on several of the motets by Johann Sebastian Bach. At which point I played an excerpt of the Handel and Haydn Society performing "Singet dem Herrn ein neues Lied." or Sing a New Song Unto the Lord. After hearing excited feedback about that excerpt, I revisited the recording of that performance and was reminded what a remarkable concert it had been and what top form our audience found our chorus in. Sing. I felt this motet would be an interesting springboard from which to discuss several topics pertaining to Bach's choral music. My guest on this episode is Handel and Haydn's resident conductor of the chorus, Scott Allen Jarrett. Scott is an expert at functioning on three hours of sleep because in addition to his work at H&H, where he also joins the chorus as a baritone, he is director of music at Boston University's Marsh Chapel, music director at Boston's Back Bay Chorale, artistic director of the Charlotte Bach Academy, guest conductor at the Oregon Bach Festival and Miami's Seraphic Fire, and is a sought-after piano collaborator, teacher, and clinician. Hello, Scott. Hi, Guy. How are you? I'm well. So good to have you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Fantastic. How are you uh, faring through this time? Well, it's amazing. I thank you for the very generous introduction. Your, your check is in the mail uh, for those kind words, for sure. You know, I didn't do so well at the beginning of it, but, you know, now after reconciling and accepting some things about it, I think, you know, I'm, I'm hitting a stride with it. And in addition to those jobs, which mostly involve preparing for rehearsals and leading rehearsals, I'm in the uh, a tenure as the president of Early Music America, which is a wonderful national advocacy and service organization for uh, early music across the country. And now that I don't have any excuse not to attend a meeting because of a rehearsal, all I do is attend meetings. So, you know, lots of good progress all around. And I'm really grateful for the community around the music that we so love. And people are not forgetting that and they care about it all Mm. the more. That's wonderful. Silver linings abound. Scott, at Marsh Chapel, you run a series called the Bach Experience, where in addition to directing a cantata during a Sunday morning church service, you speak to the audience before the service begins, highlighting some of the salient points to listen for in the music that's to come. You do this very, very well. It's always informative, always inviting, and it's really clear how much you love Bach and so many aspects of his creative genius. I don't know how you speak about other composers, but where does this love, this curiosity and admiration of Bach stem from? That's such a good question, and and probably the question that I still don't have a great answer to, except to say that I'm an academic in a certain way, and I love books. And I have a lot of books in my condo. Anybody that's ever known me knows that. And it's not that I've read every one of them, but they represent an aspiration for the kind of thing that I might wish to know. And every interaction with box music for me has that quality about it of sort of revealing something that, gosh, I wish I'd thought of or I wish I, I could have known. And I feel like there are other composers, Handel comes to mind, Mozart comes to mind, who 
absolutely flourish in the depiction of the human condition. So, you know, they rejoice in who we are with all of our, our grit and flaws. And if we don't avail ourselves of those aspects, then, then the composers fall flat. Somehow with Bach, there's an aspirational element that Bach always reveals who we could be and who we should be, especially insofar as my work has primarily been with cantatas. That coupled with a theology has been the greatest experience of my life to have regular and meaningful interaction with the composer through his music. We spoke about Bach once and you mentioned something I loved and, and think about that Bach is a metric by which you measure your life. His music is canonic and remains steadfast and you can measure your evolution against it. Well, absolutely. And I think any patron or member or subscriber or anybody in the H&H &H family will recognize this. Those folks who have come to Messiah year after year after year after year, they recognize that for, for them, the annual performance of Messiah, yes, it's a ritual, but it's also a metric. It's also a way to measure, ah, yeah, last year at this time, this event happened in our life. This year, I feel better about this. Or the loss of a dear family member. And when the soprano starts to sing, I know that my Redeemer liveth, that means something different. The same is true for B minor mass, certainly the Matthew Passion, which reveals our humanities in all its forms. But to me, the chance to have regular encounters with the masterpieces of this repertoire, with the musicians that are on the stage and performances at Symphony Hall with H&H, it's just an extraordinary experience, and life is, is surely better because of it. And that chance to re-engage with music that you know and continue to learn about is a deeply important exercise for any of us and all of us. Part of your work, like Bach's, is as a church musician. The church's role in Bach's life, uh, my, my earliest encounter with what might have been Bach's relationship with the church was reading some of the exchanges between the town fathers in Leipzig and Bach. In these, Bach is often complaining of conditions, and his audience is often dismissive and abrasive. So in a way, I grew up believing, based on this, that Bach may have suffered under the yoke of church duties. But the reality is actually much more nuanced than that, especially in light of the importance of religion in Bach's life. Can you speak to the idea of Bach and the church? Well, I mean, it's actually perhaps not as complicated as we, or nuanced as we might want to make it, insofar as a modern audience, post-enlightenment, and a country which was founded with a basic principle of separation of church and state, it's a little difficult for us to uh, understand a time and a locus in which there was one faith option. If you were born in this place, you simply were. And this is really true for uh, any resident of the city of Leipzig at that time. You know, you were Lutheran, period, the end. Leipzig was a major university town, and it was the host to a very significant book fair each year. So it was a center for very serious learning. Theological developments and movements within Lutheranism were the stuff of dinner conversations in Leipzig. And the clergy, uh, staff, and all of the congregants had quite a sophisticated understanding of the Lutheran faith and all of those that followed after Luther that contributed to the development of that theology. So I think for Bach, when he shows up in Leipzig in 1723, he had written a nice handful of cantatas, but it had not been the principal musical assignment for him. And he had written cantatas, but, but not the sort of weekly engagement with the theology uh, that he was now faced with. What is astonishing to me, having said that, is that to get the job, Bach experienced three days of oral examinations, not on music, but on theology, before he could be offered the job. As if to say, anybody that gets this far, we're certain that they're musically competent, but we need to know if they really know their theology. Such was the importance of the cantata each week, which functioned as a musical sermon. I recently performed some cantatas with my Bach Academy in Charlotte, and over the course of presenting cantatas, and I would sort of give a little talk about them at each performance, and then in some of our workshops, it became clear to me that Bach's understanding and his own reconciliation of a, of a theological point or a scripture is amazing to me, because he not only 
sort of read a text and set it to a music, but he also, by his music, reveals his opinion about that text. The example I have in mind, Guy, is Cantata 39, which is basically a sort of a social justice cantata, and it sets verses from Isaiah that invite you to do good things, uh, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, um, that, that sort of thing. And at the outset, Bach's music is dolorous, it's sad, it's, you know, the depiction is on those who are without, those poor people that we now have to help. The verses in Isaiah end up saying, of course you're going to be helpful but it's your activity of giving and being an agent for change, which is transformational. And that is the point. And over the course of that opening movement of Cantata 39, Bach takes the music on a journey that is transformational. And it becomes less about this duty to help your neighbor. Rather, it's about the transformational effect that each of us will experience by helping neighbor. The fact that he understood these theological elements at such a personal level is very moving to me. Obviously, we can't have a conversation with him and ask about that. But that's my own sort of uh, reckoning of uh, how the music comes off the page and how it's received to a modern ear. Hmm, That's an incredible insight into Bach's mechanism. Our listeners likely know of the three canonic vocal liturgical works by Bach, the St. Matthew and St. John Passions, those are the passions that survive, and the B minor Mass. Then there is a large body of cantatas, mostly liturgical, written for Sunday services, special festivals, and other occasions. The motets, one of which is our topic today, are somewhat less well-known. Would you talk about what a motet is to Bach and what features in Zingit are typical or not in the genre? So, like many musical terms, uh, their definition uh, varies according to location, uh, geography, and, and to time. For Bach, the motet was a musical form really of the generation before. And by the time Bach arrives in Leipzig, assuming his duties there, The Italian influence on music, this sort of concerted aspect of the high baroque, is the most sought-after form. And there's, you know, writing that sort of relegates the motet to the sort of, you know, country church kind of activity where they can't afford or have a populace that can supply sort of quality uh, level of instrumental playing that uh, Bach enjoyed in Leipzig. So the inheritance there is from previous generations, certainly in the Bach family, there are uh, antecedents for Bach's works. But there's, of course, the great master Heinrich Schütz, whose Die Himmel erzählen, The Heavens Are Telling, is dedicated to the Tomenerkor, to the St. Thomas Church. And for Bach, also, the term motet, as it does today, is most often associated with uh, Renaissance polyphony. And Bach used uh, an anthology, just like uh, church choirs today have on their libraries an, an anthology of, of anthems that they have in regular circulation. Bach had this volume of, uh, of motets that were in use by one of the training choirs. And so the idea was that um, a student would, would uh, learn the motet singing, sort of the old style of singing, and they would be uh, rotated at one of the four principal churches in Leipzig. And uh, once they were good enough, then they could graduate and they could begin to sing you know, cantatas. But it was part of a pedagogy and the tradition there at the Thomas Kirche. For Bach, and in terms of his output, as you rightly suggested, we typically in modern publications think that there are six motets. There are lots of other pieces in the output, plenty of instances in the B minor mass of music that is in a motet style. But in terms of the way Bach thought about the piece and the function and the timing, we typically group these six motets in one publication. Zingat dem Herrn is likely the most famous of them. The properties that unify them for Bach are not unlike cantatas. Bach will draw his text. Uh, he'll create a composite text, whether he did himself or worked with a collaborator. So the, the first thing is always there's a scriptural text. So in the case of, of Zingat dem Herrn, we have verses from Psalms 149 and from uh, 150. And those provide a context for other texts, which typically involve at least one chorale tune or a hymn tune, which sort of affirms the orthodoxy of the faith. And then there could be a new or more recent poetic text. Uh, and that is the case with Zingat dem Herrn. 
So the outer big movements, uh, it's about a 20 minute piece or 16 minute piece, depending on who's conducting. The outer movement, uh, set the psalm text. And then the inner movement, uh, which is cast in a contrasting tempo, is the composite between the chorale text and the, the newly written poetic text. In the other motets, you find the same kind of approach, and often Bach is using epistles, uh, Paul's epistles, for his text in the other pieces. And the composite then reveals a theological construct, and you have a scripture an orthodoxy with a hymn, and then a personal approach with a, a poetic text. The other distinguishing feature is that there are no independent instrumental parts, because so far you could probably say there's no difference in what I'm saying um, uh, for the motets as with the cantata. But these are substantially choral or vocal pieces. In a couple of the more obviously instrumental-looking pieces, the contratop pieces, we know that Bach wrote out doubling parts for the two choirs, but they are not independent. Zingadim Heron certainly functions in that way. Uh, so you'll have a continual group, and then you might have instruments doubling, or you might not. And that is up to the conductor or director or the group that is performing the work. There, there's no direction by Bach as to what uh, an ensemble might do in terms of orchestrating or using instruments at all. No, I mean, I, the other thing that you know our listeners should bear in mind is that Bach would be just absolutely astonished that we were having this discussion today about these pieces that he never intended to have published. And it wasn't until the, the 1740s that Bach really gave serious attention toward you know, the posterity works that would be published in sort of multi-volumes. This liturgical music and these uh, sort of functional pieces, he had no idea that they would have a life beyond their specific purpose. And indeed with the motets, it seems that most all of them were written for an occasion of a funeral. So probably the instance where you didn't have time to write a full cantata or that wasn't part of the budgeting or the rubrics to support funeral services. So you would have a, a motet instead of a cantata. The official sources around these you know, give various dates and various timings and they're often conjecture for uh, for purposes. But the aggregate all seem to have a sort of a funeral component about them or a theology that reconciles our mortality. You mentioned publishing. Uh, this work was written in 1727 or thereabouts. It was first published in 1802. So 19th century composers had access to it, but there is a whole generation of 18th century composers who had no idea what Zingat or any other motet by Bach sounded like. Well, you know, the, the story, you know, the stories around the transmission of uh, the Bach catalog through his sons is in some ways it's, it's a great interest, but it's also a great tragedy because one wonders, you know, how many more motets we might actually have out there or, or other cantatas. Uh, H&H patrons probably heard in 2019 when we performed Sing at Dame Harry, Harry Christopher's tell the wonderful story about a young Mozart traveling across Europe with his father he had the chance to see uh, the manuscript of Zingatim Heron. And there's a wonderful image that we that has been handed down of a young Mozart crawling around the floor, laying out all the pages so he could take it all in, and being absolutely inspired and astonished by the complexity and the mastery of the counterpoint. And um, one can see uh, evidence of the homage to the old master in uh, the Mozart T minor mass, with its Double chorus and uh, a highly contrapuntal writing as, as really an homage to an older style. It's interesting that you mention an older style both now and in your discussion of what a motet is because it reminds me that Bach was constantly accused of being kind of a stick-in-the-mud conservative old-fashioned composer, even by his own sons, who very much accepted modern waves sweeping their musical world. I've come across 18th century descriptions of the part of Germany in which Bach worked, uh, Thuringia, as basically being the sticks and accusations that motets were the purview of Thuringian yokel cantors, one critic writes. But I wonder how such old-fashioned music can sound so fresh and exciting and relevant. Well, you know, anybody that follows in the wake of somebody like a Bach has a terrible time. I mean, you know, I think at Symphony Hall and the dead center of the proscenium above the stage, 
There's this one name of one composer, that's Beethoven. And nobody really could accomplish a 10th symphony, you know, for a long time because the image of Beethoven just loomed so large as a legacy. And the wonderful thing about Bach's music is that people like to think of him as a, as a non-progressive, but a sort of a conservative person who basically took all existing forms and brought them to a place that was insurpassable, so we must simply go to another direction. But I think Bach had a creativity that's misrepresented by that kind of argument. I think of just the cantatas that he wrote in the first year in Leipzig in 1723. If one considers those pieces just from a standpoint of orchestration alone, he was remarkably progressive. And here's a person who basically was known in his lifetime as a guy who was a brilliant organist, and he went around and trying out organs, and he would show up and he would you know, draw a typical stop combination and test it out. And then he would say, you know, well, what does this sound, what does this stop sound like with this stop? And he orchestrates as an organist does. He's creating various textures by pulling different stops. And that's, that's quite a bit different than any of the uh, standard practices regarding instrumentation for Bach in his time. There are wonderful innovations all along the way. And certainly in the context of a motet, there just isn't anything as vocally virtuosic as Zinget de Heron. Which is a great segue to my next question, which has to do with vocal virtuosity, but not what most of us think of virtuoso singing, but the complexity involved in bringing a text to life, which I know is a topic that is dear to you. It seems to me that as long as there has been polyphonic music in church, there has been a battle between those people who want to hear the music and those whose interest is solely the text. Now, Bach writes extremely complex music for some of this text in Zinget, in a form, the motet, that even contemporary writers like Johann Matheson admit does not support the intelligibility of the text much, and maybe even shouldn't. What is it like to prepare the text and try to make it comprehensible to the listener in music such as this? This is an excellent question, and there are a lot of ways to answer it, and I'm really glad you're asking it. If we limit our discussion to the Bach motets, you know, everybody has a favorite motet. It's sort of like a Brahms symphony. Everybody loves the first symphony of Brahms they learn. That's usually their favorite. With the motets of Bach, people generally regard Zinget den Herren and Jesu Meine Freude as the two greats. And to be sure, Jesu Meine Freude has an architecture and a scope and theological drive that are just absolutely not at odds, but they're quite different from Zinget den Herren. Zinget den Herren is about the most joyful, exuberant kind of music that one can imagine. One of the uh, commentators, a uh, German musicologist, Martin Geck, he likens the kind of dialogue between the two choirs that achieve Zing at the as the kind of energy that's derived from particle collision. It's not just a graceful and elegant or even a raucous exchange or dialogue between two choirs, but a new energy is achieved when these two choirs come into contact with one another. And I, I love that image. I'm grateful for him for providing that. With regard to the text, I think um, Bach is a brilliant guide. There's no mysticism here. When Bach wants you to hear the text, he clears the texture for it to be possible. And I spend a lot of time coaching singers to just observe when Bach writes one note per syllable, a syllabic text setting, he wants the text to be heard with great clarity and understanding. There's a, a discipline required about that attention, and so Bach makes it easy for the listener. If you think about the text that's in a mass setting, Mozart or, or any, or, or even the B minor mass of Bach, the bulk of the text happens in the glory and the credo, whereas the Curie and the Sanctus have just a simple text. So in some ways you find that balance that you spoke of between text and music you find uh, that the music sometimes uh, achieves the foreground in those sections with a simpler text. And so in our case with Zinget den Herren, the psalms that are the first movement and the final movement from uh, Psalm 149, 150, they are the most overt, joyful hymns of praise. There's no uh, very tricky theological concept to take in. They are psalms of praise. End of sentence. 
So with that in mind, Bach can write a music that is busy musically because the text is understood. Also has the ability to repeat a text just like any composer. So typically the first time a text is introduced, it is set more clearly and then with more repetitions of the text, um, the, the music sort of comes into the foreground, especially with the density of the counterpoint. When you get to the middle movement of Zinga Din Heron, the tempo slows way down and it begins with uh, one of the choruses singing a chorale, a hymn in a hymn-like fashion, that is to say, uh, one note per syllable. So you're able to hear that, and then the other choir responds with the poetic text, and it is repeated enough that it becomes almost a mantra. <laughs> So when I study pieces like this, when I come to study a piece of Bach, I almost always start where he did, which is with the text. And I will see um, if the text reveals any sort of uh, suggestion about an architecture or structure, and then I'll compare that to uh, what Bach has done and how he's treated it, because he's a composer who's interested in architecture and symmetry. And then I'll examine uh, what musical ideas come out of uh, these representations of the text. So singing these pieces in Symphony Hall presents an altogether different challenge. But fortunately, we have just the best choir all around. And they are as committed to the exuberance and the profile of the character of the text as any course in the land. And uh, I think that it comes off in a, a wonderful crisp relief, uh, at least we hope it does, in Symphony Hall. Scott Allen Jarrett is resident conductor of the Handel and Haydn Society Chorus and joined me by phone from his home in Boston. He will return to complete our chat in the next episode, and I hope you will too. Meanwhile, you can find supplementary material to this episode on the Handel and Haydn Society website at handelandhaydn.org slash podcast. These include biographies, a terminology, translation of the text, and a manuscript copy of Bach's Zinget dem Herrn.
In the last episode of Tuning In, I began a conversation with Scott Allen Jarrett, resident conductor of the Handel and Haydn Society Chorus, about Bach's motet Zinget dem Helm. We left off after Scott began describing Bach's different methods for setting text and how our chorus respond to each. And then I'll examine uh, what musical ideas come out of uh, these representations of the text. So singing these pieces in Symphony Hall presents an altogether different challenge. But fortunately, we have just the best choir all around, and they are as committed to the exuberance and the profile of the character of the text as any course in the land. And uh, I think it, it comes off in a, a wonderful, crisp relief. Uh, at least we hope it does in Symphony Hall. I couldn't agree with you more. And hearing you say that makes me wonder how your experience performing this piece might be different with those doubling instruments and without, if there's any benefit to having them there. I certainly know what the benefit is for us instrumentalists, especially string players, performing music in which we are doubling voices. We can exercise our ability to literally speak with our bows by trying to mimic the way you emphasize or release certain syllables as one has to in, in any language. What is your experience of having that doubling there? Well, at the outset, I think the most obvious answer for an instrumental doubling is that it, it relieves the burden of the singer. If you have somebody playing the notes along with you, you know, that gives you a little more security and confidence. And so I think, you know, Zinga Tim Heron is one of those pieces that a lot of collegiate choruses across the globe, you know, attempt some of them every four years, some of them once a decade or something like that. And it represents a true triumph for anybody to be able to sing Zinga Tim Heron. For our chorus of wonderfully gifted and talented, uh, experienced professionals, the benefit of doing this piece with our instrumentalists truly reveals the instrumental nature of the vocal parts. Conductors love to invite the players to sing more, and they love to invite the singers to play more. And what you can see on the page with Singing Dame Heron is I likened Singing Dame Heron to a Brandenburg concerto for voices. It's very clear to me that the, the kinds of lines that you hear in the fast music is instrumental in its conception, whereas the interior music is more decidedly vocal. So we're, we're blessed with those singers who recognize that and can avail themselves of internal shapings, and then equally blessed again with, with players who actually take great pride in availing themselves of these kinds of capacities. We're constantly being told to listen to the text, to read the text, to write it above our music, and to listen to it and to try to imitate the voices. Never am I happier <laughs> to have my colleagues there than when I'm accompanying a chorus and I'm able to do that. I think it's amazing training that impacts the rest of my music making. Text selection is probably the most important step the composer takes. You've mentioned that Bach started with the text. In the outer movements, you've talked about the Psalms 149-150, translations of which will be on the podcast page for our listeners. These texts could not be more evocative when set to music. They describe singing, dancing, they describe drums and harps, rejoicing, praising. Bach's contemporary Handel is renowned for his ability to illustrate text with what we call text painting. What do you think of Bach's setting of the text in this way? Also, a great question, Guy, and I'm glad you asked it. Um, typically, Bach, uh, when he's setting a text and he's using some sort of device, a pictorial device that, that might depict what the text is about or referencing, it's often not quite as obvious as what Handel would do. I mean, Handel, Handel's real good at putting that sort of stuff in neon lights or on a big billboard. And Bach is often a little more subtle about it. And just a sort of closer look could reveal all kinds of things. For example, there's a, a wonderful, the fugue that's in the first section, Die Kinder Zion, sagt fröhlich, über ihrem Könige, sie sollen loben seinen Namen im Reihen. And that last word, 
it's sort of an antiquated word. And I think in more modern editions of the German translation of the Psalms, they use just straight up tanzen or dance. But a raya is an old country dance. And that is the word that's in uh, the Luther Bible. So you'll hear, Die Kinder ziehen sind fröhlich über ihren Rödigen zu sollen. It goes basically one syllable per note until that word Raya. And then they sing for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, and into the ninth measure on one word. So he's creating a wonderful dance around many, many notes uh, for that word dance. Another good example of, of an instance of this is just before that, uh, the choruses sort of come together and a little more tautly without much sort of horizontal music. They sing, Israel freue sich, das, 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 der ihn gemacht hat. And when they do this, the busyness on the page is on the word for rejoice. Israel freue sich. A lot of busy movement for Freya for the word rejoice. And by contrast, in all of this music, the only instance where all of that busyness, all of that ornate, fast note the material defers is for the pronoun das, 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 which refers to God. Israel rejoice in him that ingemachtat, that has made you. So des, 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 you hear uh, in that repetition. That repetition does not exist in the psalm, of course. It's added by the composer. So there are more subtle text setting uh, from the hands of the composer. Maybe there's one more, which is the final bit of that opening fast first movement. And after the subject that talks about the dance that I've already mentioned, the psalm talks about uh, that, that uh, we will sing the praise of God with instruments. So uh, the sopranos state the, the fugue first, uh, and eventually they get to, with timbrel and harp, let them sing praises unto him, or the German, mit pauken und mit harpen sollen sie spielen. And for this, Bach begins with um, a, a sort of a motto theme. Mit pauken und mit ha. So out of a very busy, ebullient texture comes this motto arpeggio, all the way up to top F, and then back down again. So every time the singers get to sing pauken, which we think of as timpani, but uh, in the psalms it's timbrel, every time that comes, there's a sort of percussive shooting out of the texture of this wonderful arpeggio. What I found amazing about this first movement, and especially this fugue that you're talking about, is that I imagine that if I were Bach, and I were the world's unsurpassed master of counterpoint, as he was. Bach's fugues, it's pretty much agreed upon, are the zenith of fugal writing. That if I were to compose a fugue, I would make sure everybody knew I was starting, that things would pause and then we would start the fugue. But thank goodness I'm not Bach. Bach is much better than I am. And this fugue, as complex and interesting as it is, starts while members of the second choir are going about their business with completely different material. Before we spoke, you sent me your study notes on the motet, thoughts and ideas you come up with while looking it over, and you had some insights into this fugue that I found interesting. Well, you're, you're so nice, Guy, to actually regard my notes, but uh, you should win a merit badge for uh, being able to read them. I've, I've never got very good marks uh, for handwriting, so... But you're exactly right. So there's a brilliant virtuosic material that opens the motet. And then for the last three verses that he sets, or for the last three lines, the last verse and a half from the opening movement are given to a, a remarkable fugue. 
And just as you say, it starts with one of the two choruses introducing the fugue in a normal way. One voice sings a subject, and then another voice enters after that section has finished. All the while, the other chorus, the second chorus, is singing material that was from the opening. And it's just sort of like backup singers almost, if you imagine it that way. But the study then reveals an amazing architecture from the composer, which is the first uh, four entrances are sung by the choristers of Choir One. And it starts with the highest voice, soprano, and then you go down through alto, tenor. And then when it gets to the bass voice, he joins the chorus two basses, and then he goes back up uh, successive entrances. So when the tenors come back with the fugue subject again, all tenors, not just choir one, uh, and the same thing for alto and then uh, soprano. So you can imagine what that does is create a compositional crescendo over the final third of this first movement. And at the end of it, and actually a way that Handel always excelled at, when there's a big horizontal or holophonic texture like this, when he comes to that great moment where all voices come together, it, it's just hard to beat uh, when they all sing together. Mm. It also sounds like he's just having compositional fun without seeing the score, which of course no one around him did because all we have are parts and a manuscript score. You wouldn't necessarily know that there is that descending and ascending shape. Uh, the choirs may not be configured in a way where you can follow who is singing, and it's so incredibly busy while that's all happening. It just sounds like he's flexing his muscles. You're exactly right, and I think for people who focus on the vocal works of Bach, you know, the vast majority of the time we're we're dealing with sin and death, and so we have something that is just him of praise. Uh, we're relieved of having to sort of consider that. And the music just could not be more electrifying. It is it's extremely difficult. So when a collegiate chorus undertakes to do this, you know, they'll spend six months trying to learn the opening and closing movements, and then they'll sort of forget that, that there's an inner part. And in some ways, uh, my own study about the piece has revealed that that inner part is really what where the meaning of the piece is uh, to be extracted. Bach sets these um, almost sort of two-dimensional psalms of praise for beginning and end. But when the interior of the piece comes, we have this really touching imagery as a father shows uh, mercy for his young children, so does the Lord for all those who fear him with childlike purity. And all of a sudden, this very joyful, overt piece becomes extremely inner and tender. Maybe it was for the funeral, not just of any person, but maybe maybe a young person. There are a lot of images around children. Vater, Kindlein, die Kinderzion, and then Kindlich Fürsten, Wein. So there's a sweetness about that image that the next time I perform it, I, I want to experiment with. <laughs> And so that's, in essence, the theological construct that you were talking about, the three sections creating one of... Well, I, I think composers of Fox Day, uh, certainly before and after, there was an expectation that you, you have a scripture, you have a biblical text, and then you have some sort of theological reconciliation of what that's supposed to mean to you today. 
That's what the theology does. And then you also have some sort of emotional or prayerful response so that there is a, you know, a multivalenced interaction with a text. You're not just left alone to sort out what does it mean, how these texts fit together, and what we are meant to learn. I wonder, Scott, do you think there's a difference between delivering the text clearly and delivering it with a conviction and even with belief? I mean, as you mentioned, all of Bach's singers, all of the congregation members, obviously, were Lutherans. Everyone in Leipzig was basically one thing, and that is Lutheran. We live in a pluralistic society, and a singer's personal belief, or lack thereof, does not factor at all into his or her joining our chorus. Our audience probably holds a variety of beliefs informed by different traditions, and few, if any, understand German, certainly not the German of Bach's time. What does this all mean to a singer attempting to represent Bach's intentions, which were undoubtedly religious? One of the reasons when we established the Bach experience that you kindly referenced earlier in the, our chat, one of the reasons that we wanted to include some educational point uh, in the lecture and the demonstration is because, first of all, we're dealing with a text that is in a very different language that not many people have working understanding of. The theology is also, uh, it's a pre-enlightenment theology, and it's difficult to sort of reconcile sometimes what those concepts are. And the music is from a different land and a different century. So in some ways, I think we have actually an easier time accessing it because it doesn't conflict with anything that we might have grown up with so to speak. I grew up in near the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, and uh, the cantatas of Bach were not regularly featured in Baptist churches there, I'll tell you that much. So uh, for me, there's really nothing in my own experience and background that could have predicted that this is the music that I would spend more time with than any other. And that is a, a wonderfully freeing uh, position from which to start and interact with Bach studies. Also, in the 21st century, we now have many, many, many decades of receipt of this extraordinary compositional legacy as concert hall music. The St. Matthew Passion and the St. John Passion are liturgical pieces. They exist for specific religious observation on the church calendar and within a liturgical practice and observance in Leipzig. The fact that they are... 98% of the time now, part of concert hall subscription series and events and so forth. And almost the, the, the Matthew Passion in particular, you know, you, you can, you can do that piece any time of the year. You don't have to just wait for Lent to come around. So universally received and understood this music has become. So with that in mind, I think, you know, all of us have the chance to come to this music and avail ourselves a variety of access points. And I think for Handel and Haydn Society, what distinguishes, amongst many things, performance from us is Harry's absolute insistence that whatever we do be musical and with intention. And, you know, and, and he gets at us from the very first rehearsal. He will address that before he will address, you know, is it together? Are you too loud or too soft? Or are you in tune? Are you not? You know, any of those sorts of more state or boring, frankly, kinds of considerations. He, he, he trusts that we will sort that out, but he is interested in the highest possible musicality right away. And he knows that this music will have the best chance to read in a hall like Symphony Hall if those values are present from the beginning. And um, that's been a great inspiration for me as a conductor as well, to be on the stage and to feel that energy that uh, our musicians are capable of conjuring. Scott, one last question. When we come back, is there anything that you would like to sing more than Zing It? I mean, really. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, <laughs> I remember a moment, uh, sort of maybe the third or fourth week of the pandemic, and, you know, I had this just very sad realization that I had not made music with another living soul in, in four weeks. And um, I, was, I was really sad about it. And I remember being moved to tears at the thought of being with three other people and singing a chord. Just the simple act of singing a chord, which I'm not able to do alone. 
you know, the, the, the harmony of the spheres made possible by the communal aspect of what we can do together. And the thought that we might not have that for a long period of time was really, was really sad to me. And, and honestly, the only thing that has sort of um, brought me out of it have been many conversations with my musical colleagues uh, and friends, but also uh, our, our patrons and subscribers and donors from all of these organizations. I try to call three to five of them in each within each organization each week, and to a person, they have reaffirmed to me uh, what's important for them in their culture, in their life, and, and how they invest their time and interest. And I have uh, a greater confidence than ever before that um, the values that we can cultivate in an institution like the Hamilton High Society have a very, very bright future. Hmm. Well, Scott, I am moved and delighted to have taken part in one of those conversations, especially knowing how much they mean to you. They certainly mean so much to me and I'm sure to our listeners. There is lots more Bach and lots more other music to talk about and I am sure we will meet here again. Thank you so, so much for your time and expertise. Thanks for doing this, guy. It's really been a pleasure. Scott Allen Jarrett is resident conductor of the Handel and Haydn Society Chorus and joined me by phone from his home in Boston. Thank you for tuning in. Please visit our webpage at handelandhaydenorg slash podcast, where in addition to previous episodes, you can find supplementary materials such as program notes, biographies, terms discussed in this episode, translation of the German text, and a copy of Bach's manuscript to Zingit dem Helm. I hope you'll join me for the next episode. Thank you for joining Bach Academy Charlotte's 2020 Virtual Bach Festival. In the first part of our podcast discussion about Bach's motet Zinget dem Herrn, the Academy's artistic director, Scott Allen Jarrett, referenced the first movement of Bach's Cantata No. 39, Brich dem Hungrigen dein Brot. As a special presentation, here is the Bach Academy's Cantata Choir and Orchestra performing that movement in February of 2020. <laughs>
That was Bach Academy Charlotte's Cantata Choir and Orchestra performing the first movement of Bach's Cantata No. 39 under the direction of Artistic Director Scott Allen Jarrett. Thank you for joining the Academy's 2020 Virtual Festival and for your support. All at the Academy wish for your good health and safety and look forward to bringing live music to you soon. Please enjoy the remainder of the festival.